Estella, with regards to side effects, because it comes with its fair share uh, list of side effects, the, uh, that is cutaneous toxicity or uh, thromboembolism, what can we do from prophylactic standpoint? That is with cocoon data, what we have seen is with skip IR as well, and anticoagulation. Please walk us through so we can negate some of these side effects. Thank you. So, so we have learned that with proactive management, um, most of the toxicity that was seen in the original trial can be decreased by half. So especially the infusion-related reactions, we are not seeing much of that because patients are getting premedicated with steroids. They get decadron a milligrams twice a day, starting two days before the infusion. And this is some, we knew that this was something that happened in the first infusion and you don't encounter later on. So I feel we've been able to manage that. We have built that in, in our protocols. So now patients get the steroids premedication. Um, the skin toxicity is more complex because it requires not only that the provider is proactive in prescribing drugs to prevent this, but that the patient takes it upon themselves to really prevent this and be an active participant. So we counsel our patients extensively to um, start taking antibiotics, oral antibiotics, topical antibiotics for the scalp. Um, we have a ceramide, ceramide moisturizer just to prevent rash in general. And then we also have antiseptic uh, creams for the fingers and fingernails. So there's a lot you can do for preventing the skin toxicity. And the cocoon data showed that, that by, you can decrease all of the skin toxicity by 50%. And that's really critical because this is a regimen that people could tell you're on the regimen because you get this rash. And they, uh, these are younger population. They, it, it really matters for them that we're proactive about it. The, thrombo, the, the, the clotting prophylaxis also can be managed uh, by starting anticoagulation. We have issues about which patients may not be candidates for anticoagulation, but I think in general, we do this for the first four months. And the other thing that we learn from the data as we have treating more patients is that a lot of the toxicity is up front and then it decreases over time, which is also very encouraging for patients to know that they're buying into a regimen that has at the end of the, on the line, better survival, but that the toxicity that they're enduring that's new is gonna get less and less over time. So we're getting better about the proactive management, dose reductions, and patients participating in the regimen. So the theme here is being proactive so that we're decreasing the risk. Helena, even though we're decreasing the risk, we still might see some of these side effects. We are eagerly waiting to see sub-Q formulation, which also decreases the risk of your infusion-related um, reactions. But let's say we are using the skip or um, regimen and you run into that infusion reaction. Do you bring that patient back for day two? What about some of those cutaneous side effects when you're running into grade one, grade two, grade three? Can you walk us through some of the clinical pearls and how to manage if you're running into these side effects? Sure. Um, I agree with Estella. I mean, obviously, prophylaxis is best. I think preventing side effects is easier and more comforting to patients than um, trying to improve things that are already there. Um, I think what's, you know, the, the community docs have been used to giving these an monoclonal antibodies for quite some time. So I do think there's a comfort level with the infusion uh, related reactions, and they really only happen on that first day. Um, and so, you know, you treat and you mitigate that day. Um, and I always, I just tell my patients, everyone reacts to this. Um, and then you come in the next day, we'll give you, we're only giving you a, sh a small amount that first day. We're giving you two thirds of the, the kind of that initial dose the second day, and really you should be absolutely fine. And that's the case for 99% you know, percent, uh, of patients. And I think they can, you walk them through that, they can understand that. I think with the uh, cutaneous toxicities, I think partnering with some of our other colleagues. So if you have dermatology or podiatry available, I always kind of try to give names and say, you know, maybe, you know, I'll set you up to see them. So, you know, you get an appointment in a few weeks. So if there are issues, um, you know, we can help work through them. I think Estella did mention exactly, you know, what I would do too. I think t uh, oral antibiotics are really important. I think this is an acneiform kind of pustular rash um, where I feel like sometimes the creams are not so effective, especially in the scalp. Um, where it's challenging with the hair to get in there. Um, so really, I think that the, the three months of the oral antibiotics and then utilizing both the um, antibiotic ointments or creams, but also some of the steroids, um, you know, topically as well, um, you know, I think tends to help. And then, and then obviously there's some of the other side effects like um, the hypoalbuminemia um, and the swelling. Um, and I always, you know, I think Actually, lymphedema for me has been really helpful, a referral to PT for that, um, but a lot of supportive care and kind of guidance there too. Out in the community, we're also seeing a lot of bispecific antibodies when it comes to our hemalignancies. This is 
completely different. The side effect profile is very different than what we see with amivantamab versus some of the bispecific antibodies we see when it comes to heme malignancies. Joshua, there is a patient that now has these side effects from amivantamab. Walk us through, are you stopping both amivantamab and lizertinib? Are you decreasing the dose? Some of those clinical aspects that you have to walk that patient through. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it, it's individual patient sort of dependent. And, you know, first off, I always ask patients, how are you doing with this side effect? And if it's a cutaneous side effect that we've tried to manage and we're not managing, you know, well enough for that patient and their quality of life, I do dose reduce. And I generally start with the amivantamab, try to keep the lizertinib on board at full dose. Uh, so there are very clear dose reduction schedules. I also sometimes hold the amivantamab and, you know, holding for a cycle or two is, is worthwhile. Remember, if you hold for more than six weeks, you do want to then split the dose again. Uh, we have actually data from the Mariposa trial that in patients who had dose holds uh, and were treated for more than four months, we looked at those who were held and those who were not held, there was really no difference in efficacy and PFS. It was the same in both of those groups. So I feel pretty confident holding the dose. And again, it's the durability. It's the long-term you know, message that I'm trying to get across to patients. And I want their quality of life to be good. So if someone has a tolerability that is, is, is not sort of bearable to them, um, I'm holding therapy.